Welcome to Module 1, the History and Value of Systems Engineering. This component here is going to talk about describing who is a systems engineer, what does a systems engineer look like, and what do they do in today's world. So first of all, you've got to go back to why are systems engineers needed. First of all, any engineer in any field can and should apply the systems engineering process and overall system thinking to his or her system. That being the case, this does not necessarily qualify them as a systems engineer. It's really important for people to think more globally and outside of their respective box. However, just stopping and doing that is not enough of the components that make a true systems engineer what they are and where they add value. And it's important for people to realize that global thinking alone is not the crux and only part of the value that a systems engineer brings to the process. There really is truly a marked distinction between somebody who truly understands and applies these principles uh, versus somebody who is just a trained, experienced system engineer who takes it to that next level. True aspects and key components of being a systems engineer include knowledge of the discipline of systems What are they? What do they do? Such as what we'll talk about here. Within their respective domain, so their industry, their business, whether it's government, uh, private enterprise, manufacturing, logistics, health insurance, health care, all those things um, within their respective organization within one of those domains. And then of course the appropriate soft skills, the ability to understand the people and change management aspects that come with understanding and, and applying systems engineering concepts. This is not an overlooked element uh, at all and should not be and in fact is one of the most difficult aspects to find in a systems engineer. Um, not that people don't have people skills per se, but oftentimes finding somebody who has good technical, uh, logical business, you know, acumen and engineering skills, and somebody who also has good people and soft skills can be difficult to find those within the same person. The reality is a truly successful systems engineer has to be able to have both of those to be successful. Let's talk through some of the general cognitive characteristics of a successful systems engineer. First of all, he or she has to understand the whole system at play and they have to see big picture. They have to see globally as to what does this matter to the whole and what is our end result? What are our end requirements that it has to meet? They have to understand interconnections and how do you close the loop? What, what is needed? Is it, if this subsystem, do they need materials? Do they need information? Do they need customer information and feedback? Do they need uh, certain performance aspects from other subsystems or from the system as a whole? The, the systems engineer is responsible for understanding how those linkages occur and to make sure that those loops are closed. Understanding the system synergy, kind of going along with that, if how do systems work together? If design is giving information to the, the product or the architectural components, how do they give the information back and forth and how do they have back in information whereas the subsystem gives feedback back to the supplying subsystem to make sure that they are working in tandem with each other. Understanding the system from multiple perspectives. The systems engineer is typically the only one person who truly looks at things from a global perspective and also looks and says how do things work not just from you know this particular subsystem but from the other one over here. Oftentimes, people in organizations can get very defensive of their areas, and a systems engineer has to be able to rise above that and be shown as completely unbiased and not playing favorites per se. Thinking creatively. Or, uh, thinking creatively. Uh, many systems are not, solutions are not just straightforward where, okay, here's an answer A, here's an answer B, just pick whichever one makes the most sense. The reality is a systems engineer needs to understand all these inner workings and sometimes think a little bit outside the box for how are there different ways to achieve the solution that they need to have without going and presenting this, the options that are immediately in front of them. There has to be a certain level of tolerance for ambiguity and uncertainty. This is another one that you see a lot in industries that are rapidly changing. Consider the health insurance industry, for example. In, the, in recent years, there's been a lot of legislation that has changed what that industry is going to be. So if you're working in one of the, in that industry, or perhaps you're even supplying information, maybe you're creating technical systems for that industry in there, you have to understand that while the future looks like this, a lot of people are very curious about what the future will look like and nobody can truly predict what that's going to be. The reality is you have to be able to understand that and say, well, that is our current reality and how do we adapt to that 
realizing that ambiguity exists and how do we mitigate that, that, that factor. Understanding the systems without getting stuck in the details. So somebody, this has to be somebody who has a good balance between getting way up and looking at things from a 30,000 foot level, but also the ability to get down in the weeds and see what is truly going on. At the same time, the people who like to get down in the weeds sometimes get stuck in there and don't like to come back up or just have a hard time coming back up and seeing the forest for the trees. A true systems engineer, somebody has to be able to look at those overarching systems, understanding those details when applicable, but not getting stuck in them. Understanding the implications of a proposed change. A proposed change of sorts has to go through and impacts multiple subsystems. And so not only do they have to understand how that impacts the most obvious ones, but how does that impact the other ones that may not be so obvious. At the same time, even though it might be the right decision, there might be some areas of that system or some stakeholders who are negatively impacted by it. A systems engineer has to understand that and be ready for it. Uh, explaining that case of why you make that change anyway or why it's still the right condition. At the same time, understanding that that particular area may have to endure more pain than they have had in the past or may need additional resources adjusted to them in order to make their components be successful. Understanding a new system concept immediately upon presentation. Things change very quickly, and especially in a very global enterprise, you have to understand all the subcomponents so that when you're presented something new and here's some new information, you can react and adapt quickly. Understanding analogies and parallelisms between systems. Sometimes some systems work together and some systems are, are, are truly unique and truly different. But understand how, if, how come it works over here? Why can't it work over here in a similar way? Why is it different or is it truly not different? And then understanding limits to growth. There are some systems and sometimes trade-offs need to be required in order to meet the goals of the project. So think back to some of those constraints. Understand those limits and what those are. The ability of a successful engineer is somebody who really has to see the future. So there has to be a true level of visionary to this here. Um, analyzing the need, concept of operations, requirements, conceptualize the solution, generate those solutions, use them to, with the tools, perform optimizations, conduct trade studies. Many of those are very taught analytical skills, but many of them are soft skills that cannot be taught and are truly inherent or ingrained within a person. Some people are born with these thought processes in mind and don't have to have a lot of experience in order to get them. Other people have to work much harder at them to, in order to be successful. The reality is even the most gifted systems engineer did not come right out of school with all these components integrated within their head. They learned some or many of them throughout the course of their career and the course of their learning on the job and their professional endeavors. From a leadership and management skills, a true systems engineer has to be a team leader. A team leader is oftentimes used as somebody who is a manager or has direct reporting staff to them. And while this may be true, leader can be by title or just by experience as well. They have to be somebody who is highly influential and respected both at the stakeholder and people doing the work level as well as the executive and overall decision maker level as well. They have to build and control that work plan, define boundaries, and take into consideration non-engineering factors. Some of those include human factors, some of those include business factors, and other things uh, that are non-technical nature but just happen and change. It could be legal infrastructure changes. It could be an organizational merger acquisition type of thing. They have to be able to integrate those and understand those within the, within the confines of their system. Human relations, somebody who's a good team player, has good communication and interpersonal skills, and then obviously willing to deal with systems, but autonomous. They have to be an independent learner and strong learning skills. The true best leaders that you will ever work with are those in there who listen to their people and then provide feedback afterwards. And if they make a decision otherwise, they usually explain, I hear what you're saying, but here's why we're going, I want to go this direction. But at the same time, if they hear information in there and it's a well-presented argument and they get new information that they can go and say, thank you, that gives me what I need. They may ask clarifying questions, but then they listen and then they trust their people as well. Um, last two are that inherent level of curiosity. Somebody who is a true systems engineer and, and those competencies that come in there 
is a person who has that natural inherent curiosity of wanting to know more. Maybe they want to know more details about a specific subsystem. Maybe they want to know a global enterprise of how things work. Maybe they want to know the requirements as well. But this is something where it's it's not a linear job in, per se. It is oftentimes given a very abstract and this person has to be able to want to know the next question. With that comes that willingness to deal with ambiguity because there's typically never going to be uh, a, a case where every question or every conceivable scenario is known. So while you have to have that next step and have that desire to want to know what's next, you also have to be able to balance that with the reality that you may not get all the information you need and that's okay. Systems engineering roles listed in here, these are all different titles that oftentimes become uh, either formally or informally to systems engineers. Um, everything from requirements owner, system designer, customer interface, process engineer is another very common one. Those oftentimes are things that people see as either uh, assignment within a project or within their job title. Uh, the one in the lower left that I think is, is most interesting and most worthy of highlighting here is glue. Because a systems engineer is somebody who truly understands everything else and brings all these components together. We'll talk more about this in the upcoming slides. So why are systems engineers needed? Well, the need for systems engineers is most apparent on large, complicated system development. The more complicated that a system is, the more important it is for all these subcomponents and subsystems to link together and work together. That's why large projects, whether it's building a highway or government uh, type of infrastructure, oftentimes employ dedicated systems engineers. Uh, that said, systems engineering is also very valid in the development, production, deployment of much smaller systems. Cameras, printers, unmanned systems, all those still have subsystems and linkages that work together or have to work together in order for the system to be successful. At the same time, you'll also notice many of those in there are rapidly changing, and technology will continue to be different now than in the future. So you want somebody as a system engineer who understands the current technology so that when new is presented, they can understand how this can work and how requirements can be met in the future forward without losing that time. Uh, most managers consider systems engineer roles during the development and integration phases as the most important. So during the development phase, defining the overall requirements and making sure that the system will conform to them, those are obviously essential and if not done properly up front, will cause problems and fi potential failures of your system in the long run. Um, at the same time, in the very end phase, when you're integrating and validating those system requirements, those are all, that is also very critical too, to ensure that those requirements have been met. Companies that understand systems engineering and principles and applications will integrate systems engineering engineers at these phases heavily and will allocate appropriate time in, in development life cycles for these components. Other organizations, conversely, that do not truly understand these concepts oftentimes gloss over them because they want to get it quicker to market, not understanding that truly over, overlooking these elements will result in longer development lead times as well as less likely of the system to meet the requirements of the end user. Systems engineering balancing. Balancing means essentially how much technology or budgeting or whatnot to include, recognizing that there are always trade-offs. There might be trade-offs with other requirements, development times, cost, risk, etc. And the systems engineer is responsible for understanding what truly is important and where are those balances necessary. Systems engineers take interdisciplinary responsibilities these teams often overlook or forget due to the press of their primary responsibilities. That's not necessarily because people in, in the system or designing or many producing the system are trying to do the wrong thing or not trying to do or not trying to do the right thing for the end product. They may only see one component of there, whereas the, senior, or the systems engineer is responsible for seeing the sum of the whole. As a result, these can oftentimes result in conflicts where the systems engineer needs to make sure to 
mitigate these conflicts as soon as possible by explaining, and here's why this is important to have seen the whole, but also under showing that they are not, they are neutral party and they are not playing favorites. They are just saying the reason we're making this decision here is because this is greater for the whole and it's not a personal thing. Short-sighted people oftentimes think of systems engineering as overhead. And the reality is, while it is overhead, there's a reason why that they exist and why that, that role is there. Most people look and say, well, the system worked well, great. Why do we need the systems engineers? The reality is the, you had the systems engineers and that's why the system worked well as, at the time. People also don't look and say, when the system didn't work well, they don't look and, and understand that maybe it was because we didn't truly adhere to the systems engineering principles. We didn't have anybody looking globally or overarching, so we had numerous little subsystems that are trying to fight within each other and make themselves better. Even organizations that truly understand systems engineering concepts oftentimes struggle to mine these skills and concepts at a global level um, just because it is so difficult to get all these linkages together, especially in increasing complex systems. At the same time, even people who have well-meaning and well-intentioned cannot oftentimes cannot think ahead of themselves to see why the value of those things exist. Challenges comes in justifying systems engineering. Again, the role truly is overhead. All, they are not necessarily going and creating a product. They are not going and developing a design element or building a component of the system. They, they are making sure that the people who are doing those elements are working in together in linkages and overarching components. That's hard for some people to understand the value of that just by seeing it because it is, it's not a very clear, definitive, here's what this area or what this person is producing. As a result, once you see issues, they tend to blame it on the particular people defining them and creating them as opposed to looking and saying we should have looked at things more globally. So I talked a little bit earlier about the glue, but the glue ties both people and technical and resources together across these subsystems. So systems engineering is the one responsible for this entire linkage. They understand when trade-offs benefit one system at the expense of the other and systems engineers are the ones who are responsible for weighing what is truly right. So they are the ones who have to go to leadership and say, here's what, in my unbiased opinion, what this correct decision might, must be. Not everybody will agree with that, even within executive leadership, but they're important to be respected and understood or, or known that they see the whole and they see all those subsystems together and they can flow up the component and subsystem perspectives. They also assist the program management in managing the program technical effort. So they will work closely with engineering or project management to uh, when they identify a problem or when problems are identified and brought to them to help say, okay, if trade-offs need to be made, how do we do it? And the systems engineers are the ones who truly can go and propose what those trade-offs may need to be. Systems engineering team designates various individuals to maintain tight liaison technical areas of the, pro of the program. Again, analysis, design, manufacturing, test, these are just a few. The reality is there are truly many more at play here. Uh, being hands-on is important to truly understand the systems that they are responsible for, but also in developing credibility amongst, this, amongst both the people in subject matter expert roles as well as the executive leadership roles. Um, the systems engineering job does include defining, clarifying, and documenting requirements, performing parametric analysis for trade-offs, or, or ensuring that it is being done by somebody, and then recognizing when interfaces impact might occur and taking early action to avoid problems. There's a lot of, it's not my job in business and industry today, but systems engineers rarely have the ability to go and say that. That's because it usually is their job. If it doesn't cleanly fall to somebody else and it starts to fall between the cracks, that's where the systems engineer has to come in and truly prove that, okay, somebody needs to see this and I need to make sure that this happens in there. At the same time, they can't become a dumping ground for business areas who don't understand what the systems engineer is doing and see them as an undertasked resource that they can go and allocate work to. Unfortunately, that is a common issue in business today as well usually by people who don't understand what a systems engineering does or, add, or truly adds value. So the systems engineer should have a good overall perspective of the system so that they can help interpret and explain motivations for requirements to the team 
and gain the acceptment, acceptance and commitment to objectives. So they will work together at all different stages of that system, the product life cycle, to ensure that they meet goals. They also want to make sure that executive leadership product oversight, process oversight, does not get surprised. Nobody likes to be surprised. If something is not going to function as it is intended, you want to identify that as early as possible. If you can make a trade-off to address it, that certainly might be the ideal solution, but there might be a case where decreased performance or decreased time or some compromise has to be made. Rather than wait until the 11th hour and then spring that on people, as soon as that is identified, that can get communicated and organization can be ready and prepared for it. It also gives people a sense of understanding that they know what is going on and, and that they are comfortable with the project.